great, exciting opportunity. Lots of great opportunities in this conversation today. And we're gonna to look at what the companies are doing well and what areas organizations might be struggling in this conversation. So let's get into some introductions and uh, I'd like to introduce myself and my colleagues. So I'm Kim Spurgeon and I oversee uh, Canada and uh, our national uh, footprint here. And uh, my background has been over 20 years in human resources consulting from delivery to sales, to coaching, to PL lead, and uh, lots of experiences primarily focused on customers. And I'm very passionate about career development and the whole focus of getting the best from our people. So let me introduce my colleague, Sarah. Sarah's the role of SVP at LHH Eastern, Canada, or Eastern US and Michael being in the West. Sarah's joined us working in LHH and some of our key customers, and she's gonna share some exciting stories today about those key customers. And she's working with some of our largest career mobility customers. So we're going to hear some little uh, pieces of insights along the way. And uh, Michael looks after Western US, and he's been in the business for many years and in a senior executive role within LHH for many years in the tech sector and the HRIS system sector. And he's also going to share some interesting stories along the way. So. The goal of this session is to be interactive as possible, so use your chat. There's the Q&A in there that you can ask questions of. Please post your questions. We're going to have some polls, so hopefully it'll be a little bit of a good conversation as we go through this uh, conversation today. So please uh, uh, be aware that we have recorded. We're recording the session and we will we'll be sending that out. As well, we'll be sending you out an article for you to follow up and read uh, post the session. So let's get started. So I think the best way to kick this off is a little bit around defining what internal mobility is. And because everybody defines it differently, I think it's really important to have that conversation. So when we've looking at the world of work, we did some research around the future of work and we all are aware with the great resignation or the great reflection that people are having uh, struggling, sorry, to uh, fill some of those roles and those gaps and make sure they're able to fill uh, the capability within the organization to compete in the future. So the best way to do that in our experience is looking at internal mobility, but not everybody's doing that. So we're going to talk a little bit around that. So mobility can mean many things to many people, but it can mean a lateral move into another department. It can be in another country. It can be for hypos. It can be a lot of things, but really looking at how do we use that to build skill set internally? How do we develop people further, which also drives engagement and retention? So that's a little bit of a context as to where we go. So I want to kick it off by asking Sarah a question around what is the uh, most important thing people need to do to be able to make internal mobility work? Yeah, I think there's lots of things organizations can do, and we're going to get into some examples of clients that are doing some things really, really well. Um, I, I will share that there are a couple hindrances um, related to internal mobility, and those include manager support and open positions. So we can all probably remember a time in our own career journeys where perhaps we were blocked by a manager who wanted to keep us. Maybe we were very, very good at a role and uh, they wanted to keep that skill set and, and, and that um, opportunity to, to maybe have us on their teams. So um, that inherently has an effect on mobility. And, and ultimately with what's been happening with the great resignation and great talent exchange, is that there's a real risk of doing that where people will now leave to go seek out some new opportunities. Um, the other one I mentioned is open roles. So if someone cannot see a distinct, clear career path, whether it's lateral, on a lattice, you know, vertical, many different opportunities, um, they, they will seek those opportunities elsewhere. So those are really the two key hindrances. And I will also make mention here that size of company does have an impact on how an individual employee feels about this. So at a smaller organization in our study, which is defined as less than a thousand employees, um, there's a greater risk, actually three times the risk of an employee feeling like the company does not support internal mobility uh, or have a strategy around that topic. So if you are a smaller organization, fear not, we have some great wisdom to depart, uh, to impart today and to share on some examples of companies we work with who are doing some really um, sometimes easy things to help encourage and support internal mobility solutions. Thanks, Sarah. So let's get into a little bit of our stats. So as Sarah mentioned, we conducted a survey in late 2021, early 2022 around 
uh, career mobility and internal mobility. And as you can see on the slide here, there's some stats and I'll save them for the recording purposes so people have them. But 50% of global respondents look at internal candidates when filling open positions. So my first question is why? What's preventing people at looking more broadly as there's a whole talent pool? Why are we not accessing it? And I think Sarah's already mentioned one example is that whole talent hoarding is a reason. But why else is that happening? And we're going to explore that a bit further. And 33% say their company culture supports job mobility. And again, what is that culture? Are we a culture that encourages people to develop, reskill, move around? Are they encouraging people to stay within one place? So we'll talk a little bit around examples where organizations actually, how the culture impacts mobility. And the last stat on here, 27% regularly measure internal career mobility. And this is an interesting stat as we look around performance reviews from senior leaders in an organization. How are they setting the tone? How are they impacting that? I've seen organization where they put it as part of their bonus criteria is actually if they're encouraging career mobility and having career conversations. So I've seen that happen in organizations. So we'll explore that a little bit in some of the situations and uh, scenarios that we're going to go through. So let's actually open it up with a poll. So we're looking for your feedback and, and we're going to launch a poll here, which is already which is already launched. So let's take a look at one to five over the last 18 months. How do you feel your organization has leveraged internal mobility? Five being great and one being poor. I think I've got that order right. So open it up there, Laura, and we'll let to see what we can uh, have in terms of results. So please go ahead and click on the button to be able to vote. Oh, let's see how it's come across so far. So 7% picked one. So saying they're not, that's a low number. Two, number two, 19% picked two, 47% three, meaning we're really in the middle, 21% four, and then only 5% said they're awesome at it. So what I'd love to hear as we go through this is maybe if you guys can put it in the chat, what are some things for those who are doing really well, what are they actually doing to get this right? I'd love to hear some suggestions if you put them in the chat. I'm going to open this up to Sarah to start off and saying, can you share some couple examples, maybe who's getting it right and what are some of the things that they're actually doing to, to figure this all out? Yeah, happy, happy to jump in here with some client examples and, and where we are hearing um, really positive results from the investments that are happening in, in mobility. Um, so mobility is not a singular thing. Uh, it has so many elements to it. And the one example that I want to start with that comes to mind is an organization that started small. Um, and, and I think that's usually going to be the case. Uh, you just don't bite off and roll out um, a, a huge internal mobility solution. You usually start somewhere small. And at this particular company, it's a Fortune 500 um, financial service company, and they were doing a lot of investment in career development. So they were seeing that as a trend of concern. And if someone did not know how to manage their career internally and the managers weren't enabling it, um, they, they, they were losing people as a result. So they started off with some workshops, candidly, just um, uh, really basic workshops with some of the populations that were the most affected, like where they were having the greatest retention issues. And uh, it has grown into a very significant offering. Um, so when they had a merger and acquisition activity happening a couple of years ago, they, they knew they needed to do more. So this is where they went from good to great, I would say. They, they moved into a solution set that was enterprise-wide and that offered an opportunity for all employees that had to potentially reapply for job opportunities because of the merger um, to, to feel empowered and to know um, that they could present a great resume and have the interview skills needed to redeploy and reconnect within their organization. So um, that's an organization that I think has just done an excellent job. Uh, they, they measure results through NPS scores and the scores have been off the charts. Um, they've gone up and up and up year over year and they've been the highest ever level in January of this year. So it's a really good example of a company who had to start kind of small with a really intact um, approach at groups that had retention issues, but have grown to an enterprise-wide solution. And it's become part of the culture now. So the culture, it's completely embedded that internal mobility is something they support, they, the managers enable it, and, and then the employees drive it. It's, it's their role to drive that. So really, really exciting example. 
Thanks, Sarah. That's a great, very good example. It gives uh, perspective of the concept of starting small. Um, Michael, I'd like to hear from you kind of on the flip side, an organization you might have encountered where they probably struggled a little bit more internal mobility and probably lower on uh, the success rate on that. Yeah, thanks, Kim. So for folks on the call, you may have heard of a movie called Field of Dreams, right? And in that movie, there was this quote that was constantly going throughout the movie that was called, if you build it, they will come. And so one of my organizations that I worked with was a manufacturing firm. They went out, they built the portal and nobody came. They had no executive, senior executive stakeholders. They had um, no additional lower level stakeholders within the organization. <laughs> Communication uh, was non-existent. And the one person that they, they, they put all this on to really drive the initiative throughout the organization ended up leaving. And so it was a portal that kind of sat dead in the water uh, for about six months before somebody actually kind of took a step back and looked at it and said, oh, this is something we should really start to take advantage of. Well, lo and behold, the APIs to the portal were sitting dead and it was no longer attached to the ATS. So it was just a, a business resource for the employees. Well, that was like a big learning for the organization that one, they didn't have alignment at the senior level. Uh, there was also no, no branding or communication of this whole initiative throughout the organization. So they were able to turn it around with a little bit of help, um, but ultimately it was a, a tougher, it was a tougher drive to create a more branded and communicated solution than if they would have actually, uh, if they would have actually done it correctly in the first place. So Michael, if you think about the one key thing that helped them get it turned around, what would you say that was? It was definitely um, stakeholders at multiple levels in the organization. They owned it to really create efficacy groups uh, throughout, whether it was at the frontline manager position or it was at the very senior uh, leadership positions in the organization. Great. Good. I just seeing some notes here in the chat when I asked people to say, what are your organizations doing to successfully make this happen? And I think Eric made a comment about the importance of having one HRIS system across the company so people can uh, leverage that yeah. um, and take advantage of that in terms of the ecosphere. Mary commented, increase referral bonuses, retention and growth bonuses, creative rotation movement to fill gaps, formalized mentorship, which are some great ideas here. Create new leadership positions to promote within and decrease current leaders workload to be able to mentor employees. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting concept. Uh, I don't know if we're always great at reducing workload. I think that always just continues to increase, but uh, thank you <laughs> for your ideas on that. So let us take a look at some additional stats from the research. So companies with effective mobility practice are this much more likely to be successful if they offer uh, help employees move to other internal jobs. So actually offer tools. So we're gonna talk a little bit about tools and what are those tools all about? And then two times more likely in terms of organizational culture that supports internal mobility. And we'll talk a little bit around that. But I think sometimes people have this vision that there's 300 steps to create internal mobility and it's not always required. There can be small bite-sized pieces. So Sarah, maybe you can give us an example of an organization that used tools to create some success around internal mobility. Yeah, I'm happy to do so. And in reading the chat too, I saw something that um, Alexandra posted about intent and being intentional, right? The intentionality aspect of things. And I, I couldn't agree more, right? That 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 intentional investment by an organization at that high level, like Michael mentioned, the key stakeholders being so important. I, I think that leads well into this conversation about um, a company that that again, I have a good example of a company that's um, done a good job with this. And they started with tools. So um, they really did start with a, a portal and it was a portal that we helped sponsor, but they had a lot of other internal solutions and um, I, I would say benefits that the organization offered. And they were looking for a way to integrate that uh, because if you have a lot of different places for people to go, sometimes you don't get them to any of those places, right? It's overwhelming. It, it, it's not, um, it, it doesn't make it easy or functional for the teams. So in this case, um, our portal became the bolt-on where things like internal job access could be bolted on. Uh, the reskilling partners that they uh, use 
could be bolted on. And so it made it a one-stop shop career mobility portal solution that enabled all of the access points needed to the many, many solutions and investments that that organization was being very intentional uh, to be make available to their employees. And I will share in this particular example, um, and it ties back to the, the whole culture piece, and I know that's represented on the slide too, is that um, part of what they've continued to invest in is looking at areas where maybe it's not being utilized. So to Michael's example earlier, this is a company that's built it out. Lots of people are using it, but they certainly look and evaluate where maybe it's not being used as much or where they're having some issues. And they noticed in their retail segment, their retail um, banking segment, that they were having a lot of turnover and a lot of concern about um, great talent walking out the door that could be secession talent down the road. And there were also some implications on diversity, belonging, and inclusion for them in that same space. Um, so they made a very intentional investment to use the tools and make those available to a population that unfortunately, because of their day jobs, didn't always have the time during the job to access those tools and resources. So um, they, they, they came up with a whole new process to address that particular population. It was so important to their culture that they thought that was a worthwhile investment and happy to report that they've made major significant double digit percentage improvement on the retention of that employee base, even in the face of the great resignation. So um, it can be done with some time, investment, executive level sponsorship, and uh, paying attention to what your data is saying as well. Thanks, Sarah. And it's interesting because as you look back at that initial stat that I gave you, 50% of people are only looking at internal talent. One of the biggest hurdles that I continually hear from organizations is like, I know we've got talent out there. I just don't know how to figure out where it is because we have no way to track skills or people's capabilities. So that really speaks to the importance of having one source of, of collecting talent data for an organization, which is critical. And uh, somebody asked a question, Kelly asked a question. Um, oh, before I get to Kelly's or to Deborah's comment here, Deborah commented, in my experience, I've seen that managers don't want to part with their high performers. We talked about that hoarding at the beginning. How can employee get around this for an internal mobility? And this is the beauty of an enterprise wide tool or resource where they can find opportunities and they can share their skill sets with people outside of their direct manager, which I think is really interesting uh, to take a look at that data. So let's do a, another little bit of a poll to see where people are sitting at. And I think it's this is an interesting poll because we often find that the direction of who's accountable for employee retention in an organization is often looking at HR. So I'd love to hear your feedback if you think it's employees accountability, do you think it's leaders accountability, organizations or all of the above. So uh, we've opened up the poll. Let's see what the results share with us. D, 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 as we wait for the results. Well, there it comes. So employees are responsible for 3%, leaders 15%, organization 5 and 85% percent all the above and that might have been a leading question because that is so true but I think there's elements that everybody takes accountability for when we often say this is HR's job it's not my job I don't have time there really is accountability with everybody in the organization and sometimes we underestimate what everybody's role is so we kind of look at it this is kind of our perspective and our point of view and how it's a shared responsibility at the end of the day employees own their own career so they need to communicate those goals their career desires, their motivators to their manager or mentor. They can't sit and wait for the tap on the shoulder. That old paternalistic view doesn't exist anymore. Managers need to own by providing opportunities for stretch assignments, enabling development, having a career conversation. And the organization needs to put components in place, whether it's an infrastructure, whether it's a tool, whether it's career development, employee development resources, but things have to come together. So it's interesting at the end of the day, it all, it always falls to HR, but in reality, we need to create a culture that, that empowers and engages accountability with everybody in the organization. So this is kind of typically how we would look at it, but really having accountability of everybody in the organization with different accountabilities to be able to support it is key. And uh, internal mobility is only going to work if everybody kind of shares in that accountability. And I think we'll share a couple of stories as we get through this. Um, but what do you think? What has your organization done to retain key talent and invest in internal mobility over the last 
18 months. So here's another opportunity for you to maybe put some of your comments and insights in the chat. I know we've got some very experienced HR folks in the in, uh, on the call. So I'd love to hear what some other organizations are doing today. That'd be nice to share with others. So if you want to add to the chat, let's see what's coming in. No, I don't see any things coming in the chat. I hear some come in. Rotational programs, I think, are a great idea. Revamp recognition programs. Increased investment in development, absolutely. Great ideas. Sharon, nice to hear from you, Sharon. Um, let's see what else is coming in here. Revisiting how we assess and develop, you know, and that's an interesting tidbit I'll just comment on is somebody asked if we could share the tools that Sarah mentioned and and I can get Sarah to talk a little bit around our tools. I think there's lots of tools out there, but the interesting thing I find we often focus on only the that we've got to find a new job for somebody, but we forget the earlier steps as to how do we get there, how do we assess people. Has anyone ever done assessment work to say, you know, what are my skills? What are my strengths? What are my aspirations? So part of that isn't purely matching to skills, but it's assessing that talent and what people want to do. Provide, oh, there's now lots of ideas flowing in here now. Formal succession management process, increased budget for employee and leader development, absolutely. Flexibility. Career discussions are critical. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Create an enterprise core and leader capability framework to support alignment from Jennifer. Those are really good ideas as we carry on, on in terms of ideas. So Michael, is there any ideas that you'd like to share that you've heard that worked? Yeah, so I'll just bring up a, a couple of examples here that we worked with organizations over the past 18 months. Um, the first one is a healthcare organization, pretty large. And they were really struggling with one, retaining general population and also re-engaging the high post. And if you think about like a healthcare organization over the last 18 months, dealing with the pandemic, you have a lot of people that one, were uneasy being an essential worker um, and, and having to uh, face that on a daily basis. And so they may, uh, you know what, they may be high, uh, high potential talent, but how do you how do you help them work through that and then redeploy them? And so the organization actually created two, um, two career paths or two actually redeployment paths. One was for hypo and one was for general population. And <clears throat> what they ended up finding is just the fact that the high potentials had an opportunity to have a, a, a different career path than the one that they were on that is making them uneasy in this very um, uh, pandemic world that was happening you know, a year, year and a half ago. They, they were actually re-engaging back into their old positions. They just wanted to know that the organization was hearing them and that the organization was looking out for them. The, the other piece on the, uh, general, <clears throat> the general population, they were gonna be losing the talent anyways, uh, just because people were ready to stay within the healthcare industry. And so they, um, they were able to actually redeploy uh, individuals that, um, you know, weren't even by redeploy through reskilling and <clears throat> and create a new career path for them that had actually touch bases, which were key touch points of individuals along that career path. So they it was almost like a multiple mentoring um, path through the organization so that they could understand what the next step is going to be for them. So the next the, uh, the other example is actually quite unique from a redeployment standpoint. Um, and this was uh, with one of our larger tech accounts that is a chip manufacturer. And they were gonna be reducing staff no matter what. But what they wanted to be able to do was also redeploy these people uh, within their own ecosystem. So they created channel partners. And so it was actually a redeployment process that was outside the organization that included um, around 20 to 25 additional organizations where you had not only the challenge, right, of making sure you had harmonized leadership within your own organization, but you also had harmonized leadership within channel partner organizations. And we were really able to assist them throughout that process. And it's been amazing because 
their productivity has actually increased around 10 to 15% because now they have the individuals that understand the processes going on within their own organization throughout their channel partners. Thanks, Michael. Sarah, do you have an example to share? I do. I'm happy to jump in. And, and my example became a little bit more relevant this morning as I read um, an article in, in CNBC about the Great Resignation and how inflation is apparently now going to um, more negatively impact the professional service and our more professional level roles uh, from, from the Great Resignation perspective. So I think this is a very timely conversation. And that was the exact concern brought up to us on a partner review call we had last week with a key client up in the Northeast. And, and they brought up that they were seeing a trend line in their very professional level. Um, they have a, a lot of mid-level professionals come into their organization, not a lot of entry level in their org. And they were seeing a sharp increase up to 25% of folks walking out the door in just 2022. So that set off some alarm bells. And um, because they have a population where they really need that keen market knowledge and, um, and, and mid-market knowledge type of uh, base, they can't just refill, refill roles with entry-level talent. Yeah. And so we talked about um, a new strategy that they're starting to explore that we're going to um, help them with a little bit, which is leveraging their retirement population. And, and you may have heard also the trend that uh, many are retiring earlier than planned during the last two years. So they're looking at a strategy that we're, again, going to partner and help them with to retain <clears throat> those retiree populations for one, two, three-year cycles just to keep that talent and that knowledge base as long as they can as things course correct with the current market conditions. So I think it's a really unique and creative strategy um, to look at a population that they know does great work. Um, they're not in a place where that retirement population is hindering the mobility of their other key talent. And I think sometimes that is a risk, right? We know organizations have to look at that as a potential risk. That's not what they're experiencing. So in this case, it's a really neat strategy to employ um, to keep that key talent and to continue to meet their customer demands and needs. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that all works out, but that that's what they're going to start doing. And they really haven't heard about a lot of others taking that as a tactic. So um, I think that is a unique way to approach. Well, I think if you think about the, the talent, uh, basically the rare ability to get talent, that's a great strategy. It'd be interesting if people post in the chat what uh, if they're finding that they're trying to build strategies around retirement. I'd love to know if other people are doing that as well. That would be great to hear. Maybe, uh, Michael, you could share with us. I'm going to move to the next slide. Some yep. of the things that you've seen in terms of the impact, potentially negative impact of not supporting internal mobility. And I think from an HR perspective, they, they get it, they see it, but there's lots of other factors at play. But maybe I'll turn that over to you. Yeah, I don't think this is a surprise to anybody on this call. Um, maybe the, the, the only ones that we can kind of talk about here is the first one is on employee retention. The 30 to 45K, uh, what we found out, you know, that's an average. If we start to add in our high potentials, <clears throat> and even to Sarah's point, right, those individuals that are retiring, if we're not retaining those individuals, we're <clears throat> it's costing the organization over $100,000 just on a high potential. The high potentials are, <clears throat> you know, their leadership succession. They're, they're normally individuals that are innovating for the organizations. Um, and when you start to lose those people, they are, um, <clears throat> they're incredibly difficult uh, to replace. So the other, um, the other two that really jump out to me on this list is um, the second bullet and then the last bullet. And I'll get to the last one in a second, but it really kind of corresponds with the first two bullet points. But <clears throat> as organizations and employees come together, right, they build an emotional contract with each other. And part of this emotional contract is, hey, I'm going to work really, really hard for your organization, and you are going to, you know, supply me with some development, some career pathing, um, and also, you know, pay me, pay me well. So, um, what, what we're starting to see is an erosion of the employee contract, especially with the, um, with the work from home, the lack of connectivity uh, within the organization. <clears throat> and so by leveraging a good career mobility 
uh, strategy within the organization, you're actually able to rebuild upon that employee contract. And ultimately the employee contract is what engages people. So it, it's a trust, right? And when the erosion of trust is gone, uh, the employee's engagement obviously starts to plummet and decrease. Um, and then finally, the loss of institutional knowledge and leveraging talent. I think I saw a couple of folks um, that were up here uh, putting comments in the, uh, in the comments section. But really, when you, when you look at the loss of institutional knowledge, a big part of internal mobility within organizations is career discussions. Mm -hmm. And part of the career discussions is making sure that we capture that institutional knowledge, right? It's special, it, you can even lose the institutional knowledge as people go through the mobility practice and, and their career paths. And so by continuing to have those career conversations throughout the organization, one, you're not gonna lose it if they leave, right? Because you have a career path for the individual, but you're not gonna also lose it once they move into a new role. Thanks, Michael. That's uh, some great insight. I'd love to hear from the rest of the, the participants on this call. What are you actually seeing and from a cost and cost <clears throat> necessarily money, but in the end it is in terms of the impact on the business. I'd love to see if you want to just post it in the chat. What you're seeing has been the impact um, of the great talent exchange in terms of the cost, meaning if you're not doing internal mobility, not having those conversations, what has been the impact? Uh, if we could see some people post, that would be great uh, in the chat. Just open it up there. Morale, heavy workloads, burnout, absolutely. That's from Leanna. Other things that you're seeing. Fatigue, turnover, absolutely from Leanne and Paula. Other things you're seeing. Impacts on culture, absolutely. From Corinne. From Nadine. Oh, nice to see you, Nadine. When talent, whoops, when talent exits the organization unexpectedly, we see battlefield promotions. Yes, that would be a whole webinar just on that conversation. Thank you. Loss of institutional knowledge, decreased productivity. Megan having to replace long tenured employees with one and a half FTE. So this is back to the institutional knowledge that Michael spoke to. So that's really interesting. Rita comments, unrealistic expectations about compensation. We're not low employee morale. Oh, that's depressing to hear all those great things. So Sarah and Michael, maybe you guys can give us a couple examples where you've seen some impacts on specific organizations. Yeah, I'm happy to jump into this. I, and absolutely, these are all very relevant um, that we are seeing across the board. Uh, you know, one one instance that I've heard come up that maybe isn't listed here, or maybe it's buried within some of these comments as well, is um, engagement is an overarching topic. But but the whole mentality of employees coming and doing the bare minimum, right? They're collecting a paycheck, they're showing up to do what is a nine to five, and then they're out the door. So. Gone are the days of those employees that probably many of us rely on that are willing to go the extra mile, willing to stay late for a, a key call. So uh, pre present, I'm going to get that wrong with presentism, right? <laughs> um, being present, uh, a better way that I can actually say that. So absolutely. And, and so the cost of that is significant. It's back to that whole point of the 1.5 replacing one person who's doing a really nice job how are we replacing the employees that aren't showing up and doing um, a little bit of the above and beyond that they have been doing historically. And then uh, Michael mentioned something earlier that I think is just uh, really relevant, which is the trust piece. I mean, that trust erosion, when that happens, it's really hard to build back up. I mean, you can lose trust in a second, you're going to have to build that back up for six months, right? So, so that aspect of things is just something that I think our clients are paying a lot of attention to so they can keep that trust going. And internal mobility and supporting someone's growth at an organization helps to support that. Yeah, it's, Sarah, it's a really good point. And I think one of the, the things that we also overlook around uh, internal mobility is, hey, it's not just high potentials and the general population, right? We work with a really large global tech firm that uh, the board of directors absolutely just were, were having a fit because they had over 200 diverse, very senior executive leaders that were leaving the organization. 
because there wasn't a career path for them and that they felt that they were being blocked. And so we were able to actually create an internal mobility program for these very senior, senior executives where we're talking EVP, SVP, and C-level officers. So um, I think one of the things you, you, can, you can talk about the burnout or just being not being present within the job, but imagine now that if you see that at the senior level, and not only the impact for those that report up to this individual, but also the brand that they take away from the organization as they leave and go on out into the market. Thanks, Michael. And there was actually a comment by Sarah in the chat saying damage to corporate brand through loss of key associates who have become disenchanted through the lack of growth and opportunity. Uh, this speaks exactly to your po point. So I think it's so critical uh, in terms of looking at that. And I, I remember doing a session with uh, senior partners in a major audit firm and accounting firm, and they were all an uh, older generation and basically said, well, I didn't have that support when I was there. Like no one gave me a career conversation and I'm fine. So, uh, you know, the, the concept, not that I would have said this, but if you can put your head in the sand, but they're going to leave if you choose not to provide it for people. So we can be, we can assume the old world of work will match the future of work, but it doesn't in terms of expectations. And I think the pandemic just proves that, that people are much more reflective on what they want. Um, I was involved in a, some research we did uh, earlier, uh, actually I did a webinar on this a, a week ago or so, is really looking at the cost and the impact of not providing career development support in terms of the business. And I think that is a critical piece that you need to look at. Uh, if, you don't, if they don't get it with you, they'll go somewhere else. And I think we're delusional to think that people are gonna stick around in this marketplace if we don't provide people what they want. And they do want career development and organizations aren't providing it. So let's finish off with a few takeaways and then we'll open it up for questions. And I think uh, I'll try to give you a few examples on this as we move through. Some of them we've already talked about. And I think um, ensuring leaders have career conversations to understand skills, capability, motivators, and interests. And I just have a funny story of this. I was working with a large Canadian bank and they developed this expat program because they thought that was the best career development opportunity anybody could have. And so they picked eight people across the entire bank to go across the like to go across the globe to be out of Canada and this was the best thing since sliced bread so they sit down after they select the eight people they want to have and four out of the seven or four out of the eight said I'm not going that that doesn't interest me I don't want to do that we're two income families we love where we live and the senior executives in that bank were kind of pounding the table going what what the heck this is the best opportunity you've ever been and so, you know, we had to have the conversation. Did you actually ask what was important in their careers? Did you ask what their motivators are? Did you ask where they wanted to spend their time? Did they ask if this is a reward for them? And so I think it just brings to light, we've got to ask people what's important in their careers to figure out where we want to move them, where there's opportunity, are they mobile before we make the assumption without actually asking them what's important in their career. So career development is very, very critical as we look to the future. And then what I would encourage organizations to do is look at lateral moves and part of that is redefining what career success looks like in an organization it is an upper proverbial ladder ladder especially if your organization's flat you have four levels and nobody above you is leaving where are you going it can't be up so stretch assignments moving aside moving to different divisions is a much more realistic options in smaller organizations and making sure you're putting those practices in place i think at the end of the day the connection to succession planning connection to career development and internal mobility, they're all linked. And so I would encourage you to think about those three big buckets in an organization. Talent development identifies needs and gaps in the organization who may not be talking to employee relations that are releasing people, who may not be talking to other divisions and talent acquisition that are looking to hire people. Those three functional groups in the organization need to come together and actually spend time working through what this might look like and that's been one of the hurdles that i've seen often is that ecosystem of those functional groups not coming together so i'll end on that note to open it up for some interesting dialogue and hopefully some good questions in our uh, chat so i'm gonna post that there if some of you could maybe add some of your commentary in there of things you'd like to ask either sarah or michael or myself so any questions you'd like to ask Sarah, Michael, any stories? I did see in the note that people are asking if we are uh, uh, sharing the slides. The goal will be we have some white papers we'll share and we'll also share the recording so you can see it. Um, so that will be done after the session. I think that was one of the questions asked. 
Um, but maybe what I'll do is one of the questions posted here is tell me a little bit more around the tool um, that Sarah mentioned that was being used in one of her examples and, and tell me more about what's included. What, is, what does that mean by tool? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. Um, so we, we do have a career mobility portal. It enables a, a, a client partner to us to have um, something that's easily accessible, that is uh, able to be rolled out to enterprise-wide type of scenario. And um, it's integrated, like I mentioned before, um, even in an SSO type of format. So I'm getting into some details, but um, I'll, I'll try to keep this a little bit more high level. It, it, it enables a, an employee to have a variety of solutions at their fingertips. So assessments for their own career, what it might be that they wanna do internally. It's all very much internally career mobility oriented. So just wanted to have, have that distinction there. It doesn't focus on an external job opportunity unless you move into a redeployment scenario and then we can bolt that on. Um, but for internal mobility, it really does have the focus that they want to be able to move internally successfully. So things like resume support, interview skills training, and again, just assessing where it is they might want to go, where are their interests. We have a career interest opportunity for them to do some assessment. Um, so there is a whole lot there. There's a bolt on with one of the clients I serve for mentorship. So their access to mentors is integrated in that solution so that they can access that. Um, there's bolt-ons to internal job posting boards, like I mentioned earlier. So um, sky's the limit. We have a lot of flexibility to customize and tailor that to the needs of the clients that we're working with. Thanks, Sarah. Michael, here's a question I think is more directed at you from Roberta. Does mm -hmm. telemobility and career mobility defend against the great resignation even if the employee leaves? Michael said something about this, and I'd like to understand the link between that, even if the talent leaves. So do you want to comment on the difference between talent mobility and career mobility? Absolutely. So let me answer that in like two ways. So the first one, as I'm looking at her question is, does it, does it defend against the great resignation? Um, yes and no. Uh, it, it does, because if you're within in, internal talent mobility and career mobility, you should be having career conversations, right? Really what we're, we're seeing on the great resignation is the frustration with all those different adjectives that everyone put in the chat earlier. You know, we've gone through 18 to 24 months of exhaustion, fatigue, uh, being overworked, uh, being trapped in their, their home office, et cetera. Um, and now with low un unemployment, we're seeing, you know, hey, uh, great, great opportunities out there with, uh, you know, great high pay, but you can get ahead of that with having career conversations. Um, and what that will allow you to do is one, understanding, you know, what are those in frustrations the employees having, you know, where are their concerns, and then you can, you can work to mitigate those. Um, doesn't mean that they won't leave the organization. Now, on the to the second part of that question, um, you know, even if the employee leaves. So the the example I used was a large tech firm that had channel partners, and so what they would actually do is they knew like ten percent of their the bottom ten percent of their organization was just going to churn and was going to leave. Um, so what they would do is they would actually hold um, uh, whether it's like a career fair or whatever with their channel partners. So yes, they're leaving the organization, but their impact is not as high because they're going to one of their channel partners where they are going to bring that institutional knowledge that they have in their organization to one of their channel partners to help on productivity and, and also streamline efficiencies and things like that. So hopefully that, that kind of answers your question, Roberta. Thanks, Michael. There's, a, there's lots of questions pouring in now, and I was going to pick one here by Poonam. How to encourage employees to move ladder with will be with maybe no associated pay increase? And I think this goes back to redefining what career mobility and career success looks like in an organization. Movement doesn't automatically mean pay increase, and I think that's part of defining what career success looks like. And I think that is an interesting ongoing challenge when how we define career success in an organization, because it isn't, as we know, isn't always about moving up a ladder. It may be lateral, which therefore means no pay increase. So I do think that will be a continually ongoing, uh, interesting perspective on that. Um, I'm just looking at a couple of the other questions that are in the, the chat to the, the panel. Um, 
So Sarah, Michael, why do you want to take this one on? How do you encourage queer conversation? Is there a broad structure made available to leaders and is there a way or need to track this? I, I can add my two cents, but I'll let you two uh, maybe comment first. I mean, yes and yes, right? So <laughs> yeah, yes, there has to be a way to track it, right? If we're, if we're gonna if we're gonna ensure success and we wanna track success and we wanna see the movement that we expect to make, if we're making these kind of investments, we, we have to be able to track the success of those conversations. So, so yes, we have mechanisms in place to do that. Um, but it does start with helping to train these leaders. I think there's assumptions when an individual contributor moves up to a leader role that they automatically know how to do this. And I saw a comment in the chat the live chat um, that also indicated, hey, nobody helped me to do this. So, you know, those are the leaders that sometimes may have the, the biggest roadblock of then paying that forward and helping their own people to navigate career development and, and mobility success. So, so we have to have the structure in place. It has to be driven top down. Uh, we have found this works best when it is sponsored at senior exec level whether that is chief HR officer level down or business leader level down. And, and candidly, where I've seen this the most effective is where line of business leaders are absolutely involved in that conversation, where there's a champion at the line of business uh, level, and that they're also encouraging that this is a business imperative. So it won't happen without that. It won't happen without leader encouragement. And uh, you don't want these silos to exist where one group is doing this and one isn't. So that's where that senior leadership uh, enablement becomes a really a key important part of this. So Kim, I know you, I think you have something to add as well. Yeah, I just thought it's interesting. One, of, I've seen some organizations to help shift their culture. They've actually made, has your leader had a career co coaching conversation with you part of their employee engagement survey and the bonus incentive for senior leaders? So if we're not doing it, you know, what doesn't get measured or tracked doesn't get done. And so I've seen it added to bonus. So that's one thing I've seen happen. Um, and so I think that's important to think about how are we actually making it happen? Sometimes, again, people, people aren't having career conversations because either they don't know what to say, they don't think that's their job, or they don't have the time. And so sometimes we need to figure out how to enable the leaders to do that. And, I, and my philosophy is, it's better to have a poor career conversation than no conversation, because people just want to be heard, right, at the end of the day. And I was doing a session with some senior leaders, and they weren't buying into the importance of career conversations. So I posted the question to them in the group, and I said, so let's take a look at your team. If your top three performers were to leave tomorrow and cross the street to your biggest competitor, what would be the impact on your business, your morale, and your team? And second to that is, do you know what would make them cross the street? And they all looked at me and went, I don't actually know what would make them cross the street. Well, that's why you need to have the career conversation. You need to understand what motivates, demotivates, and inspires people to get them to stick around. And I think we make a lot of assumptions about what motivates people without bothering to ask them. And I think at the end of the day, if you don't create an atmosphere that you encourage it, you're not going to have it. So it's some interesting dialogues I've had with individuals over the time. So I think that's kind of interesting to see. So let's take a look. Kim, um, can, I, can I chime in on one that I saw in the chat that's somewhat important? Okay, um, I saw one that was asking about AI powered career development platforms. Um, this is near and dear because we've recently partnered with a company called Sky Hive, um, H I V E. So I, I, I sometimes thought it was Sky High, but it's Sky Hive, okay. like Beehive. And um, it does incorporate AI powered um, career development tools into what is our career mobility platform. So it's, it's a really exciting partnership where then we can both on some additional um, career pathing type of solutions that didn't exist before, some advisement on what somebody should look for as it parses their resume and gives them ideas on what job opportunities they may want to pursue that perhaps an individual doesn't, doesn't realize themselves. So um, I'm a big fan of AI enabled um, career development platforms, and I think that's going to be the future for sure. Well, and I think the beauty of that is it makes it enterprise accessible versus just their hypo or just your senior leader. So I think it makes it much more accessible within an organization, right? Absolutely. Good. Okay, let's see what else is going on in the chat. So other questions that are have come in. You see other ones there. So um, I think there are, some people have answered each other's answers in, in the chat, which is great, which is nice to see it happen. 
So one of the comments by Sharon was, in my experience, if leaders don't feel they've had great career conversations or opportunities for themselves to grow and change positions, they're less likely to pay it forward. So it's back to developing at all levels versus one level. So that's a very important comment. Any other comments or questions that people have Kim, I see one in our Q&A about, um, is it maybe the best time to be pursuing a career in this space? Um, so I'm, I'm making that a very uh, quick summary of the question, but okay. um, basically that roles are emerging in talent and development, um, talent development, succession planning, career and performance management. However, those are sometimes the first jobs that might be cut at an organization historically. So is it a good time to be looking at those kind of roles? And, and my encouragement there would be, uh, for sure, those are becoming more prevalent roles at organizations we serve. So I think there's more stability in those roles than perhaps there used to be. And I would also share looking at a company, and I know, I know sometimes it's at face value and you gotta dig a little deeper, so you gotta network too, but looking at the company's value statements, where they are committed to career mobility development in their people. You can find a lot of that in their value statements and what their missions are. And then having those networking conversations with people who actually work there will give you a very good feel for is it, is it really culturally embedded or is it a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a commercial that might not be real behind the scenes. So I highly encourage you to kind of check that out. But I personally think that those roles are becoming much, much more relevant than they used to be. Yeah, and Sarah, I think you bring up a good point around um, the data and everything that goes with it, because what what <clears throat> individuals that are taking this on within their own, own organizations, uh, a lot of the times they're not measuring the return on investment that these people are bringing into the organization, right? Whether you keep a high potential from jumping to a competitor, or if you redeploy, say, five people out of a RIF of 10, I mean, those are major savings within the organization, you know, with your costs and your benefits and everything else that goes along with that and the onboarding of new talent. So I think the business case is there to say the impact of people that are that are leading this uh, throughout their organizations uh, is a lot stronger than than most senior leaders probably realize. Thanks, Michael. And we've got five minutes remaining. If there's any questions you want to post, you're more than welcome to post them in the chat. Um, we will be sending out the recording and, and, and some articles related to this top topic. Uh, Laura Chambers is on the line and she'll make sure this happens. She'll probably be sending out a, a, a survey as well to get feedback on the topic and other topics that might be of interest. And I've just closed out on the last slide here where you actually can see Sarah, Michael, and myself, uh, email addresses. If you have any questions for us, definitely reach out to us. Uh, love to share any information on this topic. We're all very passionate about the topic and the customers we've experienced in this space. And uh, I think it's an evolving topic. I think it's interesting to see mid pandemic, post pandemic, we're in theory at, and then what's a year from now gonna look like in terms of perceptions on the future work, our ability, one of the areas of topics that we didn't really dive into deeply though, is the whole concept of reskilling and upskilling, which is definitely an area that we're starting to see more organizations focusing on because that really supports internal mobility. So I'll be curious to see uh, how this plays out over the time. So thank you all for coming and love to have your insights and feedback. Please share them on the survey and reach out to any of us if you have any questions. Take care, everybody. Thank you.